But here's the way I think of it simplistically. Let's say that the atherosclerotic disease is like a hole in the road. Let's say it's like a hole in the road. And somebody comes along and says, whoa, there's a hole in the road. Let's look at a, let's put a flashing light up there that says to people, hey, there's a hole in the road. So for some people, for some people on a standard American diet, an elevated LDL may be that flashing red light that there's a hole in the road. So the flashing red light may be a signal to say there's a hole in the road, but it isn't the hole in the road. And it didn't cause the hole in the road. <laughs> when you're not looking, the flashing red light doesn't jump up and go and dig a deeper hole in the road. No, it's staying there. So if you then come along and say, whoa, there's a flashing red light, let's put a bag over the flashing red light or let's switch it off. Ha, 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 look, we're happy there's no red flashing red lights we have to worry about. Didn't fix the hole in the road. Didn't fix the hole in the road. But everybody's feeling better because you've lowered your LDL. It doesn't address your risk of cardiovascular disease and it doesn't fix the problem. And in fact, LDL is innocent of any harm. It is absolutely never, under any conditions, causative of cardiovascular disease. And I say that categorically. And there's strong evidence to support that, despite the fact that that evidence is carefully camouflaged by the people trying to sell you this drug and making trillions, $3.4 trillion last year, the statin industry made. You can't fight against that thunder, folks. So... What other therapy is there for that plaque cardiovascular disease apart from prevention? Well, if you have significant plaque, it should be treated directly. You treat the cause and you also directly treat the, the damage. And you can treat that by ballooning it, by stretching it open, by bypassing it if it's completely blocked, or by removal and replacement with the graft. So the treatment for significant, for symptomatic or significant atherosclerotic disease is to deal with the atheroma directly, invasively, by ballooning it, by stenting it, or by bypassing it or removing it and replacing it as a blood vessel. And yes, that's aggressive, but your life depends on that. There is no medical therapy, no drug, no pill, no medication that will get rid of that plaque other than treating the cause, which you should do irrespective of whether you are going to treat it with surgical or procedural intervention. So interventional cardiology and surgery are the options to deal with symptomatic or significant atherosclerotic disease, but not in a preventative way, but to treat it at certain numbers. And unfortunately, the cardiologist, oh my God, your artery is 90% blocked. Well, what is my risk with that? Because they were treating every plaque they saw and overstenting people and overballooning people, making a ton of money, killing a few people along the process because it's not an innocu innocuous process, knocking off plaque, causing heart attacks, causing strokes. But they themselves, the cardiologist a few years ago, realized that they were overstenting and overballooning. And that was kind of mud on their face because their own studies showed that some of those lesions that they were becoming very aggressive about and scaring the crap out of their patients about and overtreating was actually the wrong thing to do. So make sure you understand that the intervention is necessary rather than just fear-mongering with statins or fear-mongering with interventions that don't need to take place. But as you treat yourself, monitoring your lipids is important, not because they cause problems, but monitoring your triglycerides, monitoring your HDL, monitoring your hemoglobin A1C is far more important than monitoring your cholesterol or your LDL. Probably even monitoring VLDL is a more important marker of cardiovascular risk. And as we look at the, at the molecules we want to monitor, the most important one in my population, blood sugar, 
hemoglobin A1c, triglycerides, HDL, insulin, and C-peptide? That's going to give you the answer of disease risk and disease resolution. And then maybe getting a CAC score. Now, when we look inside the numbers, because those lipid numbers are calculated numbers, the triglycerides, the HDL, the LDL are all calculated numbers. What other numbers have greater value? Well, when we look at HDL, so-called good cholesterol, because it's a scavenger molecule that gets produced by the liver in high amounts under conditions of low-carbohydrate, high-fat, intermittent fasting dieting, you produce and elevate your HDL. And ideally, your HDL should be above 75. And the ratio of your small, dense HDL to your large HDL should be measured. But HDL, the protein on HDL, is something called an ApoA1 apoprotein, apolipoprotein. On LDL, it is the B protein, the B100 protein. And what's more important than your absolute LDL number, again, this is just a different way to look at HDL versus LDL, is the ratio between ApoA1 and ApoB100. And if the B100 ratio is high, it's associated with not causative of risk. The LDL particle number is irrelevant. The number of LDL particles you have is irrelevant. Some of our healthiest patients are lean mass hyperresponders with very high LDL. My LDL is 240, folks. 240. I should be dead right now. But if I keel over... It wasn't because my LDL caused my heart disease. So particle number is irrelevant. The next thing we can look at in terms of risk factor is the size of those LDL particles. And remember the number. So a lot of these, these companies will tell you, oh, if you've got this number that's high or this number that's... If your particle number is high, then of course... The number of big, fluffy, healthy LDL molecules versus the number of small LDL molecules is going to be elevated. The absolute number doesn't matter. But again, the ratio of big LDL particles, type A particles, and the B, the small dense particles, that ratio is important because the small dense particles are occur are in high prevalence when you are on a high carbohydrate, low fat diet because of the way the body transports cholesterol and fat. The big, fluffy, large LDL particles in high number are very important because they're transporting fat around the body. Remember, LDL is just a transport molecule for fat from the fat cells to the body and to the liver where it gets used. It only gets trapped in plaque when you already have a clot and you already have an activated macrophage or a white cell, cell that is attracting, that has a receptor for the ApoB100 molecule. If you don't have the clots, it doesn't matter how much LDL you have floating around, it ain't going to cause damage. And this is what most people, doctors out there, even cardiologists do not understand. The LDL particle, the small dense or B, so-called B bad, A awesome, versus the large fluffy A particles, that is important. And that ratio will give a risk, a risk evaluation. But do I need those kinds of numbers for the average Joe to see what their risk is? No, I don't. There are other risk markers that most doctors never test that are more important. And then the other molecule is your VLDL. And VLDL is a marker. It's the molecule that transports triglycerides from where they're typically made in the liver to the fat cells. Some triglycerides are made in the fat cells, but de novo lipogenesis, the new development of fat, the conversion of sugar to fat occurs predominantly in the liver. And if that's coming from the consumption of sugar, that's problematic. So VLDL is also a number that we look at. If it's very high, that's a concern. And that's how you evaluate cardiovascular risk, folks. But your doctor doesn't know that. All your doctor knows is LDL high statin. Please don't be a victim of their lack of knowledge. Don't be a victim of the fact that your doctor has been heavily indoctrinated by those extremely high priced reps that come in 
and tell them to sell their high-priced product. If you are interested in more knowledge about this, Google a guy called Dr. David Diamond. He's got a beautiful paper from 2016 that specifically points out the statistical manipulation, the statistical deceit, fraud, Yes, I said that fraud that the pharmaceutical companies use to demonstrate benefit of statins when there isn't any. How they manipulate statistics and how they con you in terms of that statistical utilization in primary prevention as well as secondary prevention of cardiovascular risk. Nobody talks about that because you can't make money off it. Please, please, please evaluate your risk, find evidence of disease based on your risk, and then develop a therapeutic algorithm that is heavily preventive and less so therapeutic unless it's absolutely necessary. And then the final thing that we will talk about is your three and six omega fatty acid ratio. And it is always a good idea to balance those two out, as much as I hate the word balance. Most people on a standard American diet are around 1 to 10 or 1 to 30, 3 omega versus 6 omega fatty acids. 6 omega fatty acids being pro-inflammatory, 3 omega fatty acids being anti-inflammatory for statistical purposes. You need both. You need both, okay? You need a fire alarm system and you need firemen. But if, if a child is running through the hallways of a school and pulling the fire alarm all the time when there's no fire, which is kind of what the elevated levels or the elevated ratio of six omega fatty acids are, and the firemen keep coming, but there's not enough firemen, you've got a problem. You want a ratio of around one to one, one to two, one to three at best of omega threes versus omega sixes. There's plenty of omega sixes in our diet. You want to bump up the ratio of omega-3s. And the easiest, simplest way to do that is to eat small fish, sardines, oysters, uh, mackerel, the baby fish, the high-fat fish. Could include salmon. And then also, if you have to, to use either cod liver oil, fish oil, or krill oil. And those are ways to bump up the DHA, the EPA, and the three omega fatty acids, which help you as an anti-inflammatory tool in all of your cells, including cardiovascular risk. So that's another preventative factor right there. I hope this has helped. I, I hope this hasn't confused you. If you're concerned about your cardiovascular risk, if you're concerned that you're on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, and now your LDL is going up, let us help you to be analytical of where you are based on the true numbers rather than this emotional state that cre gets created by your family doctor to convince you to take a statin that is happening on TV when pharmaceutical companies say, oh, Crestor lowered my number. Well, it did shit for your heart vascular disease. They don't say you lower your risk of cardiovascular disease. They say we lower your number. Who gives a shit about the number if it doesn't affect my risk? Please don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Don't be fear-muggered into something that is not in your best interest. Because the final thing your statin doctor is probably going to recommend is a plant-based diet that is low on red meat, low on fat, high on fruits and vegetables and healthy grains. And please don't eat salt, which is the exact diet that I would choose to create the cardiovascular disease that I'm trying to get rid of. All right, folks, I'm out. I hope this has helped. If you want to consult, text me, 561-517-0642. We'll run your numbers. We'll have this discussion with you. And we'll do it objectively. But that's my bias. So you choose. You choose how you manage your heart disease. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Thank you for watching. If there's been value to this, throw me a cup of coffee on my Patreon account, Carb Addiction Doc, $3, $9, $25. It helps to make the content free. Take care.